Well, we can just get started then. Um, our first guests are Lindsay Enzer and Jenny Vicari of the UC Davis Ombuds Office, and they're here to describe their conflict management services that are available to all UC and our employees. So, Lindsay and Jenny, do you want to tell us about the Ombuds Office services? Absolutely. Um, thank you for having us. Nice to meet all of you virtually. Um, my name is Lindsay Enser. I'm a senior associate with uh, the Ombuds office and Jenny Vicari is also joining me. Jenny, would you like to say hi really quick? Sure. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny Vicari and I'm an associate Ombuds with the Ombuds office at UC Davis. So glad to be with everyone today. Yeah. So I'll get us started and then Jenny's going to take over here in just a moment. Um, so as the Ombuds office, um, we are we want to kind of put faces to a name here, explain a little bit about what we do. Ombuds as a word doesn't necessarily evoke what it is that we are and do and how we can be helpful to you. So we're going to explain a little bit of that. Um, but basically, um, we are a resource for anyone within UC a &R, um, as well as we also serve UC Davis and UC Davis Health, um, for anyone experiencing any sort of challenge in the workplace. Maybe it's an interpersonal challenge with somebody um, who oversees you or you oversee them or it's a peer or colleague um, and we're really available to anyone within UCA and R the only demographic we don't serve our volunteers um which I realize are, are it's a, there's a high number of volunteers but we 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 here we're here for all of you um who are employed by UCA and R in any sort of way and we're a confidential off the record resource um, to talk through any kinds of concerns, situations that are going on, and help you strategize ways to effectively move forward through those difficult situations. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a sense of how we do that um, with a little exercise. And those of you who have maybe seen a presentation like this before, I know we did one for UC a &R back in July of 2022, when we first started with our MOU with um, UC a &R. But so it may be a refresher for you. For those of you who are new, um, maybe it's brand new, but I'd like you to just kind of take a moment to stick your arms out to the side, straight out to the side. Um, and then just go ahead without thinking too much, cross your arms. <laughs> Keep them crossed and just notice which arm is on top of which. Left or right. Okay. Notice that. Okay. Make a mental bookmark there. Now under your arms. Stick them straight out again. Now try to stick the opposite arm from before on top of the other. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see a funny face there. <laughs> Go ahead and drop in the chat for us. How was that for you to do that second time? Gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. Awkward, uncomfortable, yeah, odd. <laughs> oh, somebody, it was easy for somebody, a mini yoga moment. <laughs> Not natural, weird, yeah. <laughs> Had to think about it, absolutely, these are great. Um, and that's exactly what we can help people do is, you know, we often have our kind of gut reactions, our in the moment reactions to difficult things going on, conflict coming up, um, and, Sometimes that can help us, sometimes that can get in our way. So what we can do in the ombuds office is help you to kind of think carefully about what's going on and help you try out some maybe new, slightly uncomfortable or maybe more uncomfortable ways of engaging in the situation, ultimately to help you be your most effective self in the situation and get the, you know, the most positive things out of the situation that you can um, for yourself as well as others potentially. So um, that's a little bit about what we do is help, help you kind of engage in situations in some new and different ways to get new and different, and maybe better outcomes. Um, and when we think about conflict coming up, uh, you know, we might often have some different associations with that. Some of us might think of it as um, conflict is just an 
those very extreme situations where there's um, sabotage or maybe um, intense aggression or even violence. Um, but we, if we unpack it and look a little, a little more closely, we might actually find that conflict, we can think of it as even starting out as very small. So I'm just going to kind of run through a little bit of how we see that happen when we when we look at conflict and we think about conflict. So sometimes, you know, these things, you know, they start out as just minor irritants. You know, let's say I join a new work group, maybe it's a new project team, and I'm meeting some a, a new colleague, and let's call her Larissa, for example. And I'm sharing an idea in this project team meeting, and Larissa interrupts me as I'm sharing my idea. Now, maybe at first this is just a little irritant, you know, and maybe I can kind of say, okay, well, maybe Larissa, um, just maybe that's a, a different communication style um, uh, or maybe, you know, they weren't aware that I wasn't done or something like that and kind of, you know, give some benefit of the doubt there and, and kind of, you know, it's, it's still neutral in the way that I'm thinking of it and framing it. But let's say it happens a couple of more times. And at this point, now I'm feeling like maybe this is on purpose. Maybe this is because they don't like or respect me. And uh, now maybe I'm starting to kind of go to other colleagues of mine and I'm talking about how, gosh, you know, can you believe Larissa, you know, I'm telling my coworker, Pam, you know, this, this person is totally unprofessional. They're rude. They're always cutting me off. They're never letting me share. And now we've got some, you know, intensity, some judgments that are happening around, not just the behavior, but the person themselves. And there's team Lindsay, there's team maybe Larissa. <laughs> um, and so factions are forming and there's kind of ins and outs uh, and these kind of intense ways in which we're viewing the conflict and it's creating division and expanding who's involved here. And, you know, depending on what happens here, it might continue to escalate. And one way that that might end up looking is I, I now could no longer work in the same space with Larissa. I can't be on the same project meetings with them. Or when we do, it's, you know, it's really uh, escalated and it's affecting other people and it's affecting our work getting done. Or maybe I'm going out on leave and I'm, I'm so affected by it that it's affecting my health. And, and maybe that's the same for Larissa. We see that you know things can get really, really intense, and but and maybe we might think of that as being the only place where we might consider it a conflict. But what I'd invite you all to think about is that conflicts can get going at that really sort of maybe minor seeming level, and uh, if we're not taking actions, and it's not to say there's you know big actions necessarily women have to take early on, but we might want to start thinking very you know, be thoughtful um, and and consider it around how are we going to engage in this situation so that it doesn't end up at this big, um, big nasty place. <laughs> uh, because, it, you know, conflict is just part of life and it's, it's going to come up. And so how can we kind of notice it early on and practice maybe some of those different moves? Um, and so that's where, you know, we come in as a resource is when we, we want to start thinking about what can I do, even at an early stage or at any stage. So that's where I'm going to hand things over to Jenny to, to talk about how we can help. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. So here are uh, more issues that we work with people on. So whether it's interactions with colleagues or others that you work with, um, concerns about how behavior might intersect with the formal realm, and we can talk about what are options and where to report concerns of potential potential discrimination or harassment or abrasive conduct. Um, and an important note here is that the ombuds is an off-the-record resource. So we don't take complaints or grievances or formal reports, nor will talking with us about these kinds of issues that you might be experiencing lead to our office putting anything in writing. We do not do that. We don't keep records. And we'll get more into how the ombuds office works in another couple of slides here. But, you know, uh, Lindsay, could you go back here? Thanks. 
so some other issues to finish up the list here that we can discuss include how your group or team is functioning, whether you're a team member or uh, a leader figure coming to us, career advancement issues, complaint processes. So this might be you know, ways to follow up or maybe where you might reach out to for more information. Uh, and then difficult behavior. So how to work with that, clarify what it is that you need and communicate um, perhaps more effectively with the other person. So this is quite the list. And as you look at this list, you might be thinking, wow, that's hard stuff. Uh, I, I hope I don't experience any of that in my work setting. And we think it's useful to think about conflict as um, something to navigate through. So not strictly as something that's bad or that yields minimal good outcomes. Um, and there's more to say on this if, Lindsay, you'd be able to advance the slide. So, you know, how do we make it manageable? How do we make conflict manageable? Might be something like this, by seeing how it's natural, normal, neutral, and necessary. So what do we mean by this? And we like the metaphor of fire, uh, because if you think about fire and what it can do, on the one hand, it can destroy forests, uh, homes, lives. It can be really destructive. And what else about fire? It also gives us light and heat, warmth, ecosystem renewal. So fire, it's really, it's multifaceted. It's difficult and it's also useful. It's neutral and it's also needed in many ways. And conflict can be similar, right? As Lindsay said, as long as you work with people, conflict is somewhat bound to come up somewhere, somehow. And if you navigate it well, then you might be able to be a bit more creative and more productive uh, and gain more understanding of other points of view too. Uh, next slide. So zooming in a little bit, how do we harness that positive potential of conflict? Here's some of what um, you might expect when you meet with an ombuds. So in the ombuds office, we think about building bridges across difficult terrain. And if you're here at one end of a conflict and you're open to assessing the landscape for ways to build those bridges, we're here to help you assess different options and strategies that you can employ, think through benefits, drawbacks, um, risks potentially of some of those choices. And conflict is complex. So we can help you help work with you to break it down to what are your core needs and interests and consider ways as well to de-escalate in the situation. And then as well, we also have a broad working knowledge of many UC resources and may be able to point you to ones that could be relevant for your concerns. And then as well, uh, conflict, you might have heard the phrase before that no two conflicts are exactly the same. So we're here as a thought partner if it's helpful for you. Uh, next slide. So here's how we operate as that thought partner. And these ethical principles come from the International Ombuds Association that guide how we operate. And for those of you who may have heard of um, or interfaced with the office, attended that mid-2022 session, hopefully this part sounds familiar. Uh, so under UC policy and an office charter that we have, we are designated to be able to hear concerns confidentially. And it's this level of confidentiality that allows people to share things with us that they may not surface elsewhere. And it helps you because we hear things and potentially even with your permission, we might be able to provide an early warning to um, an office or a place that might be able to be a resource for you or potentially look further into the matter and help you consider ways to most effectively bring it forward. Impartiality means that we don't take sides. Instead, we help people figure out what are their options and then let them choose how they want to move forward. And then informality means that the Ombuds office is not a fact-finding place. And we're also separate from formal complaint processes, although we may be able to point you in the direction of reporting resources as an option. And then we're also independent by design, so we do report to the offices of the Chancellor and Provost at UC Davis, but not on details of any individual cases that come through our office. And then lastly, we are voluntary, so no one can compel or mandate you to meet with an ombuds, so it's really if it's helpful for you or those that you work with. And then next slide. All right, so another way other than these individual meetings to get some ideas and 
also to be proactive is through these conflict competence workshops that we offer. And you can find these in the UC Learning Center. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. So if you'd um, if you see the link there in the chat, this is a link to our trainings webpage. The link to the UC Learning Center is on that webpage, as well as all these descriptions that you see here and dates for each of the offerings that we have upcoming. So these courses uh, have pretty great content that can be really useful and applicable no matter your designation within UCANR. Uh, most of our team are the trainers for these workshops. So we work every day with what we teach in these classes. And we try to bring in scenarios, make these a bit interactive um, and make it engaging. What I will say is the workshops, specifically the scenarios too, are crafted with uh, staff experiences in mind. And at the same time, the kinds of behaviors and the challenges that are talked about in these workshops can be relevant no matter what designation you are. So whether you're staff or academic personnel, faculty, or another kind of employee. And then next slide here. All right, so here's what we offer in terms of services. We've talked about a couple of these already. Uh, so individual meetings, these are 90 minute, 90, 90 minute confidential sessions about your specific situation. So again, we don't keep records as in we don't retain names or information of those that we meet with. It's conflict coaching in a confidential environment. And then if there's interest in a facilitated conversation or working together with your group, we can explore that as well. Uh, and then community-wide workshops, these are the conflict competence workshops that were on the previous slide. And we can also bring a tailored version of some of that content or other content specific to your group's needs to your team or group. And lastly, informational sessions are presentations like these where we come and we inform people about what we do and how we might be helpful for you. And then next slide. Alrighty, so this here is a QR code. Um, so we, we have an office newsletter where we share new offerings, upcoming workshops, um, tip sheets that we've created, updates, lots of good information. And if you're interested, uh, this QR code here is a link to the website where you can be added to the listserv. There is also a link um, right off of our office homepage as well. Okay, and then this is what conflict competence mean when we means when we use that term. Uh, ultimately, we're hoping to work with the people who reach out to us on ways that they can reach positive outcomes in their conflict situations and to be able to help folks think about how to do that strategically and how to do that well. And next slide. Okay, so this should be our last slide. This is our contact information and our website. And if you have any questions about our processes or would like to inquire about a tailored workshop, schedule an individual meeting, this is the number to reach us at. Um, so we're here to help people, this is our slogan, who come with a problem to be able to leave with a plan. So we're here when you're ready and interested to meet and talk through your situation. Uh, and then if there's any remaining time here, Lindsay and I can stay on for another minute or two to answer some quick questions. Thank you. Terrific. Um, if you could drop your questions into the Q&A, then they'll be able to see them to answer them. I like your fire metaphor. Our fire advisors use good fire to prevent catastrophic fires. So I think we can all relate to that metaphor. Yeah, thank it's a tool. You. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Great services. I hope that anyone who needs them will take advantage. There is a question in the chat, not in the Q&A, but um, and oh. I, you may have mentioned it, something related to it, but does your ombuds unit provide any stats each year to the UC Davis leadership on the number of cases or level of conflict? Yeah, so, so, like Jenny said, we are informal. We, you know, we're not keeping records. We do have, you know, very anonymized aggregate data, um, just on on very, you know, like zoomed out kinds of kinds of things, like number of cases, um, you know, impact, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so, so yes, um, but it is very, very at the kind of anonymous level because of the confidentiality of the people that use our office. 
And I don't know if there's more that you want to add there, Jenny. Uh, I would say that's accurate. Um, in terms of number of cases specifically, um, our director, Lauren Bloom, uh, does meet with leadership uh, to provide information where relevant. Um, it's a little bit different with UC Davis, UC Davis Health and UC ANR. We're relatively new, about a year in or so, to working with UC ANR. So still seeing how the numbers work and whatnot. Um, but as an example, on the Davis campus this past year, we saw about 900 appointments. We have a question from Mike. Are emails to the Ombuds office subject to the Freedom of Information Act discovery? So Ombuds office emails are, you know, they're, they are subject to that. So we recommend that people call so that we're creating, we're not creating a record of having had somebody in touch with our office. Good question. And, and if people do email us, we ask that they not include um, any confidential information, that it's just the scheduling information. But even that does, does create a record. So we're, we really recommend calling. Great, right, good information. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you for joining us. I guess if we have no more questions, let's go to the leadership update. Glenda, how's EcoFarm? EcoFarm is pretty amazing, although I will say Asilomar is not the easiest place to get around when one is in a walking boot. But um, they have little golf carts that come and move me occasionally, so that's great. I, I did get to see the exhibit we have in the exhibit hall uh, this this morning and uh, got some great folks here from A&R, from several different parts of A&R. Uh, so a lot of them are doing speaking gigs. They're working the, the booth that we've got. Uh, I'm speaking tomorrow on a panel around the uh, farm bill, but uh, it's really great to have folks here and and make sure that the, the eco farm attendees know what A&R is doing. So thrilled to be here. Plus, I needed to get out of my house and get someplace uh, to, to interact with people. So it's it's great to be here. Um, I don't have a lot in the way of updates. We have been really jumping back into meetings in January. We've already had a governing council meeting and a dean's council we're, uh, and a PAC meeting, and we're getting ready for a VP council next week. So, so we've been doing a lot of that kind of catch up and getting everybody together. Uh, very exciting. Uh, one question everybody has been looking at is the budget. And I don't have a lot for you all on the budget because, um, you know, it's at that early stage. The governor has released his budget. And I probably the most exciting thing about that was learning that California potentially only has a $38 billion deficit this year. And, and I know it seems odd to say only when talking about 38 billion, but the LAO's office was calling it 68 billion, uh, you know, double uh, prior to that. So having having half the deficit is a lot easier to deal with. And what the governor's planning to do is defer some payments, uh, not have large one-time outlays, and use some of the rainy day funds. And we've, we've managed to build up a really large rainy day fund here in California. So the good news is, as of now, we, we anticipate no cutting whatsoever to UC system. Um, UC system was promised a 5% increase as part of the compact agreement. That is likely going to be deferred for a year, but ultimately paid. And, and as far as we know, A&R's 5% increase is part of that arrangement. Um, we do know that tentatively a couple of our, our specific dollars, like for Nutrition Policy Institute, uh, are included in the governor's budget. But again, this is January governor's initial budget release. What's going to happen now is the legislature is going to look at it. They're going to chew on it. There's going to be a lot of budget analysis. And at the end of the day, what's really going to be a lot more accurate is the May revise, where after all the legislative hearings, uh, there'll be the negotiations between the legislature and the governor. We'll get a budget that's getting very close to accurate, although, you know, the legislature still has until June 6th, 15th to get it done. 
So right now, that's the main thing I can offer you up about the budget. We are keeping a very close eye on it. Similarly, um, we're getting our team ready to go back to Carrot in February this year. We're going earlier uh, to walk the halls of Congress and push for our federal budget. Uh, it looks like, um, well, frankly, I'm afraid to say what D.C. looks like uh, other than chaos. Uh, there's they they did not meet the January deadline for USDA's budget. There's talk of a continuing resolution, which will probably have to happen this week because that deadline's tomorrow. So uh, I imagine I, I haven't actually looked at the news today to be honest, but maybe the CRs already happened, but it, it's going to happen today or tomorrow. And farm bill is likely getting pushed out. Some folks say until the end of this this fiscal year, but this is an election year. And it, it would surprise the heck out of me to see a farm bill done during an election year. So I have a feeling we're going to see farm bill um, postponed until 2025. And what that means is they'll just keep the current programs running along um, unless something unusual happens. You know, there's a lot of controversy there over nutrition programs, et cetera. The good news is our research programs funding, you know, cooperative extension and AES, et cetera, um, do not appear to be controversial right now. There's some strong bipartisan support for those. So that's always good. But nevertheless, we're taking our team. We're going to walk the halls. We're going to make sure that our California congressional delegation is aware of all the great work all of you are doing around the state. And, and thanks to all of you for getting that info in. I cannot emphasize how important it is for you to get those those good news stories, those impact reports, to, to get the reporting into our, our uh, planning and analysis folks so that they can put these reports together and we can do the annual report and have all that to share with people. It's just critically important, particularly at this time of the year, both before we talk to state legislators, Congress, and all of you when you're giving reports to your county government as well. So for all of you to get your reports in on time and you share, and I know Pam appreciates this too, because. She makes great use of those impact stories via um, um, Facebook and Twitter and everything else. And by the way, Pam, I want a brownie point for getting a picture on Facebook yesterday, particularly one with me holding a snake. So I hope you posted that. Oh. I got to visit the uh, Fort Ord Natural Reserve yesterday, one of the UC Natural Reserves, and uh, did a did a, a little uh picture with their their resident king snake which is actually a very nice little critter by the way uh and we looked at some land there that uc santa cruz has got some property and water they want to start doing some agricultural research uh plots and facilities and they want to partner with us on that so it was really exciting to see that and to see how excited uc santa cruz is to potentially work with us i'll leave it at that and see if there's any questions thank you um well, I am excited to announce that Catherine Sewell has been named as the acting director of the Community Nutrition and Health Unit, while uh, Amira Resnick is out on maternity leave. So we're wishing Amira the best and uh, uh, know that uh, for all of you that are in that unit, we are moving forward. I'm meeting with the team, the leadership team on a uh, bi-weekly basis or thereabouts. And so just know that that is moving forward. Uh, gentle reminder to all supervisors that um, the uh, performance cycle uh, for performance reviews, that reviews are due by the 2nd of February. So please get those in. And then uh, on a personal note, um, I had the opportunity to do a couple of things this week already. And one of those was to attend one of the listening sessions for our strategic visioning um, down in Riverside. And it was a pleasure to meet uh, many of my colleagues down in the South, um, as well as uh, the campus specialists and uh, college leadership. And afterwards, I got to hang out with the Hort team uh, program team, and uh, I've I've met with a number of the program teams uh, already, but if you're having a team meeting, invite me. I would love to come and learn and engage with you uh, because I genuinely want to get to know you. And uh, I'm looking forward to, and I'm working with our, our county directors to schedule uh, meetings this year where I plan on attending and, and uh, meeting with all of you. Uh, over the course of the next 12 months. 
uh, in your county. So I'm not asking you to travel. I'm going to be coming to you to just basically shut up, listen, and learn. And so I want you to feel like you can tell me what you think I need to hear more than what you think I want to hear. And so uh, some of you have uh, taken me up on that, and I look forward to working with you uh, going forward. But uh, with that, Pam, I'm happy to answer questions or or uh, pass it back. Oh, to a leadership perspective. Uh, I don't have a lot of update today. Um, just a very quick note to say that uh, we've had uh, reasonable success with Aggie Enterprise. We still have some hiccups that we're working through in terms of making sure that our data transfer properly. Um, our data center has successfully moved to a, a professionally operated uh, data warehouse facility in Roseville. We'll continue over the next few months to strengthen our technology environment to support our business transitions that we have planned for a very long time now. And that combined with the fact that we have a controller on board. Uh, if you recall, Jake McGuire was our controller for many, many years, who retired at the end of 2021. Um, we have a new controller and she starts with us this week. Her name is Lana Schweitzker. You'll get to meet her in the future. She just started, so she's not here today, but uh, um, I look forward to introducing her and having her help us with the transition process that, that's really important to our future state. Okay. And happy new year for everyone. Terrific. Thank you. Too. Pam, can, can I also take this opportunity, um, if I might, to introduce Maya Manyar? And Maya, if you turn on your camera, that would be great. We're actually sitting in the same office here at the Second Street Building. Um, I sent out a couple of announcements over the past month or so that we've done a reorganization of the program support unit uh, in order uh, to better accommodate the growing demand for events uh, services and event support. And so uh, we've divided that unit into two parts. One part is going to be focused on executive events. These are high profile events that partner us with elected officials, regents, the PAC, Etc. Um, and Sherry, I'm so uh, pleased to say, has accepted uh, the director of that side of the PSU uh, team to be the director of that side. Um, for the internal um, programmatic research and extension events, so what most of you on this on this uh, meeting today would uh, are used to interfacing with PSU on. Um, Maya has agreed to come in from New York. Um, she's had a lot of events management experience, primarily in the theater arena, uh, as we've discovered today, has a lot of crossover to what we do. Um, and she has come in from New York uh, on an interim basis while we conduct that search to help to support uh, that team. So please, if you're in the Second Street building, uh, reach out to Maya. Everyone can contact PSU in the same way you always have. So it's the same email address. Uh, and Maya can, uh, after we I get done here, I'll paste her email address. Uh, she just got it today. Uh, in fact, her first day was Monday, uh, Tuesday, because it was a holiday Monday uh, with us. So with that, welcome, Maya. I know you're going to be interfacing with a lot of people on this call. <laughs> all right. Thanks. That's all I have, Pam. Thanks. Thanks. Maya, do you want to say hello so that you get spotlighted? We're in the, we're in the same office. We're in the same office. Apologies. Um, I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I look forward to meeting with and working with probably many, if not all of you. So uh, give me a minute as I settle in and then we'll hit the ground running. <laughs> Well, you have a fantastic team to work with. So welcome. Okay. Now we'll go to the story from the field. Max Farabee is a CalFresh Healthy Living UC Cooperative Extension Community Educator in Alameda County. And he's here to tell us about his latest project. Max? Um, thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Again, my name is Max. I'm with CalFresh Healthy Living, UCCE in Alameda County. Um, my focus is on adults and seniors. Next slide. 
So CalFresh Healthy Living, University of California, empowers SNAP-Ed el eligible Californians to improve their health through education aligned with policy, systems, and environmental change initiatives, which strengthen community partnerships, resulting in healthy and active living. Next slide. We provide effective evidence-based youth, adult, older adult, and family-centered and intergenerational lessons that are engaging and interactive. Our goals are to increase nutrition and physical activity knowledge, skills, and practice, and act as a catalyst for healthy living change through policy systems and environmental strategies. Today, I'm going to share about one of our projects that will highlight how our mission and goals become reality. South County Homeless Project is an interim emergency housing program located in Hayward, California. The building is on county property, but it's operated by an agency called Building Opportunities for Self-Sufficiency. South County Homeless Project houses up to 24 residents at a time, each staying approximately three to 12 months. In years past, before I started offering classes there, they had a therapeutic flower garden. Next slide. In 2017 through 2023, we reached residents at the site through direct ed classes, which included Rethink Your Drink, Food Safety, Making Every Dollar Count, Eat Healthy, Be Active Community Workshops, and Fresh from the Garden. In summer of 2022, discussions with staff began around how to start using the backyard space, potentially for a vegetable garden. I knew it would be a lot of work based on what you see here. Next slide. However, in October 2022, a small structure fire occurred, motivating the county to clean up the brush and maintain the yard. This presented the perfect opportunity for us to work with residents and staff to turn the weed-filled beds into an actual food-producing garden. Once staff at South County Homeless and CalFresh agreed on a plan to rejuvenate and maintain the garden beds, we scheduled dates once a month starting December 2022, alternating each month between a nutrition activity and a garden activity. Then we asked the UC Master Gardeners of Alameda County for help. When I first reached out to the Master Gardeners, it was to schedule a speaker to present gardening basics at the shelter as the yard was still a big mess. But I wanted to gauge resident interest in having a garden that they would help to maintain. Veronica Fuchsen and Pam Sogi were the presenters. They were enthusiastic and knowledgeable. Ms. Lena, the, the intake staff at South County Homeless, really took an affinity to Veronica and I knew fostering this relationship could be beneficial. Next slide, okay. When I asked the Master Gardeners how they might be able to help with the garden project, they shared that they may be able to donate some plants and that they could help teach the residents how to prep and maintain the, uh, the small garden beds. After that, the Alameda County Master Gardeners attended a planning meeting with South County Homeless and CalFresh to discuss how to make the idea feasible. They outlined needs, planned action steps, and helped to create a timeline to install the garden. They also mapped out garden beds and helped residents and staff develop a veggie planting list. They also acquired volunteers to help us replace, replace soil and remove weeds. And they donated half of over 50 seedlings used to create the garden, including tomatoes, zucchini, cucumbers, arugula, basil, bush beans, tarragon, and mint. Our first work day in early February was mild and dry. The Master Gardener volunteers helped evaluate the soil that was in the existing beds and with CalFresh Healthy Living staff and South County Homeless Project residents prepared it for planting. Then it rained heavily for long periods for the rest of February and into March, 
delaying our planting until April when it was dry enough to work. On April 11th, we were finally able to put seedlings into the ground. In addition to those seedlings provided by the master gardeners, we planted lettuce, kale, onions, Swiss chard, pole beans, cilantro, parsley, rosemary, and oregano. Here, the master gardeners show the residents how to transplant the seedlings into beds. Next slide. Our first sign of success, seedlings were transplanted and established successfully. Plants grew quickly and they were hardy. In May, we began to harvest uh, uh, we began to harvest lettuce greens. Then in June, we harvested green beans, cucumbers, and even kale and onions. Through the summer months, residents helped to maintain the garden and harvest veggies well into September and early October. The harvested veggies were used in the kitchen by staff for various dishes, including salads, sandwiches, and pasta dishes. Also, Cal Fresh Healthy Living used the harvest in our Fresh from the Garden programming for tasting and cooking demos. Here's a quote from a resident after a summer squash tasting demo and tomatoes we used to make gazpacho. The quote reads, I was surprised how good the raw summer squash tasted and how the, flour, the flavor was different after it was cooked. I'll definitely be adding more zucchini to my plate. That was Selena, uh, Selena from South County Homeless. Next slide. Of course, we had our share of challenges. Overly wet weather in late winter and early spring caused later than desired planting. And once the seedlings were planted, the weather became unseasonably warm, which caused many plants to bolt and go to seed early. Another challenge at this site is resident participation. While staff fully supports having the garden, none actually have time to work in the garden. The new cook is learning how to harvest so she can use the veggies in their freshest state. Previously, however, the residents would harvest and take the veggies into the kitchen to be washed and stored. So the work in the garden is done entirely by residents. And with about 24 residents living there at one time, usually only four to six are actually interested in gardening. Gardening is not a priority for the residents. Generally, time spent at this facility is three to six months, and it's important to remember most are seeking new homes or jobs or both. Even the residents that are into the garden and love everything about it, including weeding and controlling pests, don't usually stay around for very long because living at South County Homeless is transitional and very temporary. And naturally, we cannot talk about challenges in the garden without mentioning pests. We had a variety of identified and not yet identified pests, which included snails or slugs, aphids, and cats. Here are the two top photos show tiny basil trying to recover after being eaten by slugs. The two bottom photos show aphids um, on the rainbow chard. Here's a cutworm that I found in one of the beds and an image of damage caused by another pest. In the two lower photos, you can see on the left where a cat has been digging and on the right where we placed a scat cat barrier to prevent them from wanting to walk on it or dig anymore. And of course, our biggest challenge is water access. The water spigot is, no, is located next to the street at the front of the building, here where you see the blue arrow. The garden is in the yard area behind the fence, behind the building, where you see the green arrow. In order for residents to water, they have to take the hose out, stretch it across the sidewalk path at the edge of the driveway, all the way to the backyard. The hose cannot be left out, uh, because it's stretch, uh, stretched out because it presents a tripping hazard as it passes right across the main pathway. 
Also, they can't leave it coiled up at the spigot due to heavy traffic and high visibility because it would get stolen. So they must put it away after every use. After completing two successful classes from the redeveloped Fresh from the Garden curriculum, we are looking forward to more when the new materials are available. In the meantime, we will continue to provide direct education classes from the other nutrition-based curriculums. We will continue to maintain close connections to the Alameda County Master Gardeners and expect to schedule other speaking engagements this year, maybe seed starting or seed saving. And currently the residents and the cook are tending and harvesting some cool season crops, but have expressed interest and input in what they'd like to grow this summer. Our main goal is to continue working with staff and build rapport with the county so we, we can get them to install a water source near the garden area. That would allow us to install drip irrigation. We are also working with the cook to plan and supplement more meal, meals based on what will be ready for harvest in the garden. Finally, we will continue developing partnerships. For example, we'd like to partner with the master food preservers to talk about drying and storing herbs. We'd also like to find other sites where we can share garden to table programming and work in the community with residents to grow their own food and enjoy the health and benefits it brings. Our garden activities directly affected and contributed to the wellness of over 20 residents for the first six months of 2023 and for staff. We expect to double that for the next period ending June, 2024. Indirectly, the impact is immeasurable. Participants will share their experience and learned knowledge with family, friends, and community. Some will grow, some will grow food and have gardens of their own. Thank you all for your attention and a very special thanks to Alameda County Master Gardeners. That concludes my presentation. Terrific, man. Just even seeing the transformation from the dried weeds to the beautiful garden, it's got to make the homeless people feel like people care about them. That's nice. Yeah, you might want to check the chat for the, the kudos coming awesome. way, Max. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Do we have any questions? I'm checking the chat. Looks like it's all just great job. Outstanding impact. It's too, I mean, it's great that these people are finding permanent homes, but it's too bad that you have such high turnover with the participants. We do have high turnover. And as I say, uh, the longest most of them stay there is, is a year. And so because of COVID, that got stretched out a little bit. And there was one participant in particular who, in the beginning, she she didn't want anything really to do with the garden, except she was there every time we worked in it. And at the end, she was helping to harvest. And I, I noticed a, a, a personal difference in her. Um, in the beginning, she was really depressed and not really motivated or outgoing. Um, and now she's working and she won't be at the homeless shelter much longer. So, yeah. Well, that's good. Shanna asks, where do the funds come from for the balance of the plants that you planted? Well, so the funds are, uh, they come through, through the Cal Fresh Healthy Living uh, edible, it's an edible thing. So we buy the plants through Cal Fresh Healthy Living funds. And then I, again, half of them were donated through the Master Gardeners. Right. Stephanie was wondering if you've had any backlash from people who maybe neighbors that don't want that in their backyard? Well, as I said, the homeless shelter is a county facility and it's been there longer than me. Um, so I'm sure there's, a, you know, backlash, but it doesn't come to me. Good. Um, Allison asks, can you talk more about ideas you've come up with or discussed about motivating the participants to pass on their work in the garden 
to those who come in after them? Well, so Ms. Lena, who is the intake coordinator there, um, they do a lot of uh, skill building within. And we have a book, uh, a garden book, where there's notes and entries. And that book is kind of passed down from whoever's there to the next person to the next person. So it's kept at the front um, next to where guests sign in and out. So it's very visible when you walk in. When I walk in, after I sign in, if I make any notes, I can write those in the book. But it's open to anybody who works in the garden. And when we harvest and plant, we try to write those things down. So all that information is there. And there's, pre there's photos from our first harvest. There's information about uh, pest control that we've used. So I'm going to have to get a bigger binder. But that's really the way that we uh, talk about um, passing it down. And I've only been there for a year now. So I'll let you know more next year. And Don points out that high turnover means that you're reaching more people. And Jody says, maybe you plant a seed in the minds of the people who leave for permanent housing. Maybe they'll keep gardening. Yeah, that's the idea. And I know that there's several people, um, Raphael, who was one of the, uh, in the beginning photos when they actually planted, when he moved out, he told me, he came back actually and watered after he had moved out. Um, and I ran into him once and he told me he was going to be starting his own garden. So I know that a few people, it really makes an impact. Terrific. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you again for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time to join us and present. Can we see the next slide? The next slide is just a sampling of some of the people who have taken time to work with reporters and talk about their research. I was actually surprised at how many stories came out of the research by Jalindra and Tapan about climate change increasing the populations of pests. Even Newsweek and, and mainstream radio was interested in that. And Morris Pateski has been everywhere. You've probably seen him quoted in stories about the avian flu. It's causing so many birds to either die of disease or be put down. Allie Hill is new to ANR. And she did a study about the unintended consequences of a new labor law on farm workers. Michael Kahn was quoted as, as an expert about groundwater contamination. And I don't know how to say Hamate. Um, Cohen was quoted about the fruit fly quarantines. And Andrew Sutherland was in a video about cockroaches. Michael Yang in Fresno did a TV interview about frost damage. And you can see these stories and many more if you go to our website, UC ANR in the news. Thanks, Maria. Let's see the new hires. You already met Maya. And here are some others. You might check to see who's near you. And welcome them. And Glenda was talking about UC Santa Cruz earlier. We have a new specialist, Crystal. I'm not sure how to say her last name. Lee Hod. She's the new agroecology specialist based at Santa Cruz. And we have a new fire advisor up in Humboldt, Leo. Haven't met them yet, but excited to have somebody up there. Oh, Sonia points out that Lana will be on the list. Oh, she is on the list. We just don't have a photo of her. 
Oh, Cleo's online. Welcome, Cleo. They say if you want to talk fire, water, or native partnerships, get a hold of Cleo. Cleo, I emailed you. Send me some information so I can do a story about you. And yeah, welcome to all the new employees. It's great. Um, do we have any other update? We learned today that there's a summer work experience program where if you would like to have a student join you on your projects, you can apply. Um, the deadline is February 9th. I'm going to drop the information into the chat. If no one has any other announcements. Pam, the only thing I'll add is I just confirmed that within the past hour, the House has passed a continuing resolution for the USDA budget and a few other agencies until March. So we, we at least have a little breathing room as we try to get federal budgets underdone. Right. Thank you, Glenda. Well, our next town hall will be February 15th. Thank you to our speakers, Max and Lindsay and Jenny. Always very informative presentations and makes me feel great about being part of ANR. Thank you.